Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Michael Rosen, and my guest, I'm sure you know, is uh, Professor Michael Sandell. Um, when I was young uh, in Britain in the 1960s, um, television uh, was a family affair, and uh, almost all the shows were imported from uh, the United States. And the one that uh, would keep British families together on a Sunday evening was called This Is Your Life presented by a genial Irishman called Eamon Andrews, who would jump out from behind um, a pillar and confront people with a red book in which uh, their life was recorded and uh, put them on a chair and go through their life and career. That's not exactly what I'm going to do this evening, but uh, it does remind me a little bit of, of what we're doing because uh, among many uh, distinctions that our guest has this evening uh, is that he's a very famous uh, philosophical interlocutor. And something like that happened on This Is Your Life and one of the most celebrated programs. Eamon Andrews was himself put in uh, the chair and given the red book. So I think that's what we're going to try and do in the next couple of hours is to... Uh, to to, to, to uh, uh, take this uh, very famous uh, uh, philosophical interlocutor and engage in a little bit of gentle, what would you prefer, reflective equilibrium or dialectic together. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start by um, reminding you a little bit about the outline of um, uh, Michael's uh, very distinguished career. I won't um, go into all of his distinctions because that would take up far too much of our time. Um, but he was born in Minnesota in 1953 um, and his family moved to um, California when he was young, so he graduated from Palisades High School, uh, from where he went to Brandeis University, where he studied politics, graduating in 1975. Um, he was then a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, at Balliol College, um, where he completed a doctorate, a DPhil, as we say in Oxford, not a PhD, uh, note that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in 1981. And uh, in 1980, he started teaching at Harvard. It was in 1980 that he gave the very first uh, justice class, um, something to which we will return. It was my great good fortune to be in Harvard in 1981-82. Um, and uh, I, th I think justice is uh, celebrated in Harvard and beyond as a remarkable social phenomenon. Anyone who's uh, taken it or taught it, uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing to see Michael holding uh, several hundred uh, rambunctious uh, Harvard undergraduates in the palm of his hand. Uh, but if I may say so, uh, it's remarkable enough uh, in a very senior um, uh, uh, Harvard professor uh, to see him doing it as a man in his uh, late 1920s, who to me, as uh, I was in the audience, seemed hardly older than his students, was even more astonishing. Anyway, that's something that I well remember. He is now the Anti and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government Theory. And I'm going to remind you of a few of his books. Um, in 1982, he published Liberalism and the Limits of Justice, in 1996, Democracy's Discontent. Uh, in 2007, The Case Against Perfection, Ethics in the Age of Genetic Engineering. And in 2012, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. And last but not least, uh, he's working on a book to be published in uh, the fall of this year, The Tyranny of Merit. Um, Michael, I hope you don't have anything to correct about that. Could I start Thank by you. asking you a little, to talk a little bit about your path into philosophy? Because I think I'm not wrong when I say that it, you were perhaps, a, how could I put it, something of an accidental philosopher. You didn't originally believe that you were going to be a philosopher. How did that happen? Right. Well, I came, first of all, thank you, Michael, for convening this discussion, and thank you all for joining us. I came late to philosophy as an undergraduate, and before that, I was uh, intensely interested in politics, and not the high theory of it, but actual political argument and debate, and elections and campaigns. That's what I studied mainly as an undergraduate. Not much philosophy then. Then when I, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, when I graduated 
from college, I thought maybe go to law school, maybe go into political journalism, which I loved. Uh, I thought maybe uh, become a politician and run for office. And uh, academia was a distant fourth place uh, <laughs> possibility. <laughs> And so when I um, arrived in Oxford, I figured, since I'd been focused on concrete aspects uh, and empirical aspects of politics and economics and history, uh, that I would study a term or two of philosophy just to fill in my background and then move back to the things that really interested me. And one, some, one term uh, turned into a second. In that second term, I was persuaded by an influential tutor to uh, take up Kant's critique of pure reason, which seemed to me a very strange idea at the time. And before I knew it, I was hooked uh, by philosophy and there studied, well, Hegel and Kant and Marx and then back to Plato and Aristotle and Spinoza along the way and contemporary moral and political philosophy, which was unavoidable in Oxford those days. So that's how I became, I sort of fell into it. And uh, instead of staying two years, I wound up uh, figuring I'd stay three to do a defil. Um, by then, I was writing about the political philosophy of contemporary liberalism, the Kantian tradition, and John Rawls. Uh, but I had, didn't finish my dissertation in time, so I stayed on for a fourth year uh, with a kind of part time fill in teaching uh, post. And uh, then managed to finish the dissertation, and I didn't haven't quite emerged since. I'm still struggling to emerge, but there I yeah there I was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I know the feeling. Uh, but uh, well, that's great. I, I I want to come back and talk to you about uh, you know this this trajectory from politics to philosophy and perhaps yeah. also the tra trajectory from philosophy back to politics yes. um, because I think that's been one of the themes of your career and yeah. it's a very Im interesting and important subject. But you've opened it up. You mentioned that you were studying Kant and Hegel, studying contemporary phil political philosophy. Right. Um, everyone, I think, in this room knows your book, Liberalism and the Limits of Justice. Uh, by the standards, by any standards, it was, has been a book with a very great deal of impact by the standards of uh, philosophy dissertations. <laughs> it's been quite sensational. Uh, so I thought perhaps we could start by uh, talking about some of the ideas that are in that. And uh, I, I would say um, that there seem to be um, three ingredients in that critique of liberalism, uh, not all of them spelled out in liberalism in the limits of justice, but uh, ones that emerged um, shortly after. Um, the first would be um, uh, the reproach to uh, modern liberalism that its protest of remaining met metaphysically agnostic notwithstanding, it still uh, has a latent commitment to a version of the Kantian self that you call the unencumbered self. That's the first um, thing. The second is uh, that its commitment to neutrality between competing conceptions of the good is more questionable than uh, it might at first appear. And thirdly, and I think this is something that came out pretty soon after the book, but wasn't so much there in the book, um, that that supports a certain conception of modern politics, something mm. that you called a procedural republic. Is that um, a fair? Yes. Um, overstatement. Would you like to go into that a little bit more? It's, it's a very good summary, Michael. And so I, I would say the central argument, uh, as I understood it, was uh, taking on the claim that's powerfully influential and, and attractive in contemporary liberalism, that a just society uh, seeks not to impose or endorse any particular conception of the good life, but to uh, govern itself according to a framework of rights, a set of principles of justice that are neutral among competing conceptions of the good life. So 
That was the version of contemporary liberalism indebted to Kant and Rawls in various uh, versions that I was taking aim at. And part of the way of uh, taking aim at it was, just as you described, to identify the conception of the self or of the uh, moral agent, the conception of the person that seemed to uh, me to underlie that claim. And that was a conception of the self according to which the self is given prior to its purposes and ends. It's a choosing self related to its aims and attachments um, as uh, through choice or through an act of will of some form or another. And it's complicated in Kant. It's, uh, but there, there is this act of will that relates us to our ends and in a different way in Rawls. So those were the, um, that was the target and that, that was the claim that there, is an, that there is an impoverished conception of the self uh, that underlies this aspiration to neutrality. Good. Well, uh, at this point, we can go in two directions. I want to go a little bit in the one, but not to go too far down it. I don't want to spend too much time on uh, Kant and Rawls exegesis. We right. might clear the room uh, rather, rather too quickly. Right, right. What or, or create a riot of disagreement. Oh, right. yes, that's wonderful. That's right. We'll, yeah. we'll sort them out and they can vote beforehand. Yeah. I, I know you do this. They, you know, who's for Kant, who's for Hegel? And then, uh, and then when we've had our little debate, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll vote again. But no, no. I, 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 so, but the thing that interests me more right. um, is, as it were, um, broadening this out yeah. into the critique of liberalism. Right. So um, the sense that the self in, uh, in, in modern society is in some way impoverished yeah. um, is, if I may say so, not something that you... Um, came to originally. Right. Um, it's uh, we 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 find it in uh, your and my teacher Charles Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, how far do you think that uh, what you are doing is 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 um, uh, I wouldn't say reprising, but extending um, his critique? And how uh, or do you see yourself as having a, a different view? Well, I'm I'm deeply indebted to Charles Taylor, and in fact, he arrived at Oxford in my second year there, and he had just published his big book on Hegel. And um, here, I had been studying Kant and trying to make sense of Kant, to come to grips with Kant, and had only just become kind of dimly aware, trying to make my way through what Hegel's critique of Kant was, and uh, Charles Taylor then arrives the year later and is lecturing on uh, Kant and Hegel also on Rousseau and on Aristotle. And so I, um, I was deeply influenced by what I learned from Charles Taylor um, about Hegel and Hegel's critique of Kant um, and in particular Hegel's insistence that freedom um, uh, ha and personhood need to be situated in an ethical life. So that line of critique was very powerful uh, to my way of thinking. But also going back to Aristotle and taking tutorials with Charles Taylor on Aristotle, uh, on whom, of course, Hegel himself draws, and uh, Aristotle's conception of politics and uh, political association as oriented to a telos, or a purpose, or an end, that too was a powerful uh, source of inspiration in trying to think through what seemed to me, though I couldn't quite articulate it at the time, uh, inadequate in Kant's account and, in a similar way, that of Rawls. Well, at this point, I feel duty-bound to uh, make um, a point that you, you will have heard made uh, to you for the last 30-odd years, not least by me, um, and ask you to respond to it. So oh. uh, the Wallsian says uh, in response, look, uh, Sandel, uh, you're trying to convict uh, rules of 
having this impoverished conception of the self because the self has to be seen as choosing. That's a misunderstanding. What's really at stake for the Rawlsian is using this idea of contract not as a way of endorsing an impoverished conception of the self, but of a kind of pluralism in which selves, some of which will be you know, deeply committed to um, perhaps illiberal ways of life, right. um, others who will have a much more modernist or even hedonist view. But you know, those plural selves, will, with, with their different conceptions of the good, can accommodate themselves in a liberal society. And this is just a divisive representation. Yeah. Uh, I'm so, sorry, this is a very familiar thing. But how would you respond to that? Yeah. Well, this is the response of political liberalism. Indeed. Rawls's political liberalism. And the idea there is that when I emphasize those passages in A Theory of Justice, where Rawls wrote, the self is prior to the ends that are affirmed by it, I was over-reading that as, as offering a conception of the self as uh, related to its ends as a choosing self. And really what uh, uh, justifies the claim for the priority of the right over the good is not a particular conception of the self, but just as you say, the fact of pluralism, the fact that we live in pluralist societies where people have different conceptions of the good, different substantive moral and religious conceptions. And therefore, we should seek principles of justice that don't take sides, that don't require government to, or, or the basic structure of society to endorse one or another of these competing conceptions of the good. Uh, it's about taking account of the fact of reasonable pluralism, not about affirming a particular conception of the self. Um, my re response to that is, of course, to agree that in modern societies uh, we have a plurality of conceptions of the good. But I think it's equally true that in modern societies, we find a plurality of conceptions of justice, of the right. We have, uh, our disagreements are as vigorous and as deep when we argue about, for example, what does it mean to respect the right to freedom of speech, and that's to do with the concept of the right, as the disagreements we have about virtue and the best way to live. So uh, I think that the, uh, the fact of reasonable pluralism can't be restricted only to competing moral and religious conceptions, but applies equally to competing conceptions of justice and of rights. And if that's true, then the asymmetry which is still at the heart of Rawls's conception, even in political liberalism, the asymmetry between the right and the good um, is, is not defensible. Because the pluralism that, I agree, applies to rival conceptions of the good also applies and needs to be debated with respect to competing principles of right, competing principles of justice. Well, that is incredibly interesting to me because um, you've gone in a d direction which is a little different from, well, actually very different, it seems to me, from the one that I might have expected you to go in. So we've been talking about uh, Hegel, we've been talking about Charles Taylor, we've been talking about Aristotle, you've invoked the idea of a telos, and all of that was sort of preparing me to, to and us to hear, well, here's uh, this liberal... Uh, emphasis on diversity, right. um, it's misguided. We should be looking for some um, shared um, level of commonality um, instead, um, to which, you know, well, there's, there, there are different responses and debates. But it, as I hear you, um, in a certain way, what you're saying is to go even further than, uh, than, than, than rules, where rules points out uh, diversity 
at the level of conceptions of life um, and ethics and religious belief, right. uh, you take it further into uh, conceptions of justice. Now, that <laughs> slightly uh, upsets me because my next question uh, was going to be, well, you know, you, you'd come, you and... Uh, Charles Taylor and Michael Waltzo and, 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 and uh, Alistair McIntyre had come to, be, to have a label applied to you, which I know you don't like, right. uh, <laughs> communitarianism, right. uh, and uh, you know, using that in, in scare quotes and, and so on. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to ask you, um, was, it, was it possible in your view um, to find an alternative to, to, to liberalism that would be somehow more teleological? Now, from what you've said, uh, perhaps you're not uh, so, so, so committed to that. But I'd love to hear you uh, talk about, uh, as it were, whether your criticism of rules is on the side of teleology or on the side of even greater pluralism, or po possibly both. I th well, both, if I can have that choice. I would say both for the following reason. I think that uh, to reject the asymmetry between the right and the good um, is uh, uh, compatible with um, a kind of moral reasoning in both domains, reasoning about the right and reasoning about the good, that draws on teleological conceptions, and yet that recognizes pluralism in both domains. By pluralism, I mean uh, uh, acknowledging the uh, inescapably contestable character of arguments about justice and basic rights on the one hand and about moral and religious conceptions on the other. I think the moral reasoning that has to take place in both domains in arguments about justice and rights and in debates about the best way to live I think that moral reasoning uh, can't be detached altogether from reasoning about the purposes and ends of the good life in the case of conceptions of the good or of political community in the case of justice. That's why I say both, that the moral reasoning involved, whether we're debating uh, competing conceptions of justice or of virtue and the good life, the moral reasoning involved has an unavoidably teleological dimension in both cases and a pluralist dimension in both cases, uh, uh, recognizing the inescapably contestable character of moral reasoning, whether about justice or about the good. That's very interesting, very helpful. And I want to come back in a, in a minute to press you a little bit more yeah. uh, on, on, on that. But I uh, just want to be clear now. So you're um, rejecting the asymmetry between the right and the good isn't a rejection of the distinction between the right and the good, or is it? It's to reject um, a, a hard and fast philosophically uh, uh, inscribed uh, fixed uh, contrast between the two. Uh, it's to... Uh, uh, I guess to insist on an interplay between the two, to go to the example of freedom of speech, the right to free speech, which has to do with the domain of justice, the basic structure. I don't think, for example, we can resolve uh, debates about free speech and hate speech. Does hate speech count? Should, should it be protected as free speech? Or should it sometimes be restricted? I don't think we can work our way through that debate which is a debate about justice and the right, without asking questions about what is the purpose or the end that freedom of speech properly aims at, that's a teleological argument, which begins to connect it to the conception, uh, some conception of the good society. So I think the, the uh, I, I don't reject the distinction between a justice or the right on the one hand, and comp competing conceptions of good on the other, but I think they're reciprocally dependent. Okay.
But that, I mean, so to go back and put it in, in more simple terms, the thing that drives Rawls when he starts to make this distinction, uh, it's not just a conceptual distinction, it's an ethical and political distinction against a kind of utilitarian instrumentalism, right. which is um, going to envisage um, the possibility that, um, to put it bluntly, individuals can be sacrificed for the greater good. And yeah. uh, you know, coming out of, 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 of rules is rather abstract ways of putting it. We have the much more uh, vigorous way of another teacher of yours, Ronald Dworkin, uh, who talks about rights as trumps. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm not going to say that you wouldn't endorse um, rights, but would you endorse a view of rights as trumps, or does this picture that you've given suggest that even trumps can be, um, uh, as it were, um, over-trumped by um, teleological considerations? I think rights are very important, and I think part of the misdirected polemic that arose in the aftermath of liberalism and the limits of justice and the, 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 the sometimes wooden uh, construal of the liberal communitarian debate, so-called, uh, was the suggestion that the kind of view I was defending or that Charles Taylor or Michael Walser uh, were defending um, didn't take rights seriously. I think that uh, rights can be uh, defended on a conception that ties them to the good. Whether they're trumps um, depends. First of all, what counts as respecting the right um, will depend in many cases on contested conceptions of the ends that right aims at or is for. Think back to the free speech case. Does that undermine the idea of rights as trumps? In Dworkin's sense, it probably does. Uh, in, in, in that, according to that kind of liberalism, to see the right, say, to free speech as bound up with some argument about the good is already to deprive it of the independence and freestanding character that the slogan rights are trumps uh, evokes. So in that sense, I reject rights as trumps. But that doesn't mean I reject rights or their importance. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, it makes yeah. per perfect uh, sense. And of course, there's a, the, the Dawkinian comeback would be something like, well, yes, I mean, right, there's rights and rights. There's the, uh, the, the uh, values that rights are protecting, which are the real trumps, and there's the instantiation of those in, you know, have you got the right to um, hold a demonstration in the middle of a roadway? No, um, you know, and, and so on. But that, 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 that I think will take, you know, I, I think my purpose is to try and articulate your, your view as clearly as I can, and that's a very helpful way of doing it. Um, so let me come back then to the, um, to the, to the picture that you gave of what um, teleology is doing in moral dispute. Um, it's there as part of moral reasoning yeah. in a situation of contestation. Yeah. Uh, that is baffling to me. <laughs> Again, you know, <laughs> and this isn't just for the sake of argument. I'm just going to put it very vulgarly because I don't see, yeah. you know, okay, so either you share a telos, in which case you can argue in terms of it, or you don't, yeah. uh, in which case um, you're stuck. Uh, how does teleological reasoning uh, help when people are basically divided about Teloi? Well, the, the equally blunt answer, Michael, is we, we never know that in advance. We can't know until we try. But I think that's not unique to teleological moral reasoning. I think that's true of moral reasoning generally, whether with respect to any particular uh, morally contested question uh, we can reach agreement is not something we can know without <coughs> giving it a try. Uh, trying to reason our way to some shared understanding. Uh, part of what I reject, I suppose, in uh, the notion of liberal public reason, which comes out also in political liberalism, 
is the idea that we can anticipate in advance those moral or political disputes where we can, in principle, come to agreement and those where we can't. I think we can't know that until we try. And I think that even to engage in moral reasoning, whether it's about justice or whether it's about how to live, uh, to engage in contestation, deliberation about that, does presuppose the possibility that we could come to sh some shared understanding. It presupposes the possibility, but there is never a guarantee. And we can't know until we try. And that's equally the case, so I would suggest, with debates about justice and debates about virtue and the good life. Great. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very tempted. I, I will say something on Rawls's behalf. I mean, uh, Rawls is uh, a lot less uh, coherent than one would sometimes, or a lot less consistent than one would sometimes like him. And he definitely says uh, in the course of a theory of justice that, well, if we find out that we disagree about justice, that too would be a very interesting thing uh, to discover. But he doesn't explore that, uh, I, I, I grant you, and he does, uh, you know, for 500 and odd pages out of the 530 page book, he writes as if uh, agreement about justice can be taken for granted. Well, here's, a, here's another way of putting the question. Uh, is it helpful to try to identify in advance um, uh, principles of liberal public reason that can guide by constraining deliberation? And I say no because the constraints of liberal public reason, specifying what kinds of reasons are appropriate or relevant or legitimate, and which ones aren't, for fear that they'll introduce hopeless disagreement, I think that's a mistake. Because if I'm right about the reciprocal dependence of justice and conceptions of the good, then it wouldn't be possible to specify in advance of moral argument or deliberation constraints on the kinds of reasons that uh, are appropriate or that should count, be they religious or be they to do with virtue or whatever the, the constraints of liberal public reason might rule out. So I'm for a, kind of, um, for a more spacious public reason than the constraints of liberal public reason, whether Rawlsian or Habermasian, would allow. I would say, uh, let's just take all comers, see what people have to say, and try through a kind of hermeneutic of public deliberation to see what we learn and how far we get. And it's impossible, I would suggest, to specify in advance what sorts of reasons are relevant to that project. That's great. Now, I'm going to come back to some of those things. That you've, yeah. you've started some things. Uh, uh, but I wanted to ask something before moving on, uh, again, about liberalism and the limits of justice, it's something political. Um, so from what you've said, um, the, it seems uh, very clear that, uh, as, 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 we've, uh, as, as, we've, as you've articulated, that your view is, uh, is, is not uh, uh, that the, the pluralist uh, bit of rules was wrong, that in, in a way it wasn't pluralist enough. Yeah, yes, uh, exactly. But when the book yeah. uh, came out and alongside it with Could your... I just add, uh, take, take religious arguments, bringing religion to bear. It, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm open to that. I would not rule that out in it. In it yes, I, so yeah, I was going to say, yeah. oh, well, okay, one way of putting it is yeah. that you too, like rules, are in favor of reflective equilibrium. You yes. just don't, don't want to constrain it yes. as much as he does. Yes. So yes. So yes. okay. So you are, you you're, you're you're in a certain way going further uh, yeah. in in the in the pluralist reflective yes. equilibrium direction. Yes. Right. Uh, but when the book came out, it was and and the uh, books and and articles and uh, writings oh. of your <laughs> co C word members uh, at the, around that time in the early 1980s. One of the reasons why. Uh, they, you were eager, it was eagerly seized on, and uh, you know, I'd like your views on this, is that it seemed to be vindicating um, uh, various views which were opposed to uh, 
liberalism, um, conservatism, and possibly even a radical form of, uh, of, of you know, not necessarily Marxism, but some form of radical social critique. Yeah. Was that wrong? Wrong to see that... That you, were, that that you, it, and, uh, you and McIntyre and Walzer and, and Taylor were, uh, were, 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 you know, on the same side as, shall we say, the sort of people whom you would find, well, you already did find uh, McIntyre at Notre Dame and people who'd uh, had, had uh, mounted critiques of liberalism on things of Straussians and, right. and, and other conservatives who'd been critical of liberalism before right. you. I think there were certain shared sympathies on the same side um, in, uh, in partisan political terms, no, not necessarily, but on the same side in the sense of wanting to <laughs> welcome philosophical uh, argument that uh, was not subject to the constraints of liberal public reason, I suppose you could say that, yeah, we were on the same side, or the view we were advancing uh, was uh, uh, sympathetic to the various positions that you were just describing, uh, to, to more conservative than liberalism, and also some versions to the left of liberalism, yes. So, uh, and I suppose the, the, the test would be um, that they, um, McIntyre, both in his more radical and in his more conservative views, yeah. um, and uh, particularly Walzer, would say that modern society um, consists of a kind of deficit in, to put it in Hegelian terms, Zittlichkeit, in yes. ethical substance, yes. that there's something. Is that something that you thought then or think now? Yes. Um, and how would, how, would you, how would you express that? In what, in what way? Is it just an inevitable feature of a modern capitalist society? Is there something that could be done about it? Well, I hope there is something that can be done about it. And I think that if we connect this to politics, which uh, I think is part of what you were suggesting you... you That's the you hope of this conversation, is that, uh, that our detour through the abstract will get right. back to some quite specific politi well, political Well, this, things. in a way, in, uh, points us back in the direction of politics, because I think that um, as Rawls was writing, and then as those of us in the 80s were raising questions about it, uh, that ver the version of liberalism that he articulated and that we've just now been discussing was already, um, it was already losing its capacity to inspire uh, politically. And it was what happened, I think, say, from the 80s till now, is that mainstream call it liberal uh, or call it neoliberal uh, politics, neoliberal globalization and so on, um, unfolded in a way that drained public discourse of substantive moral and ethical substance, largely in the name of avoiding the clash of competing conceptions of the good, of religion, of fundamentalism, uh, and now of xenophobic nationalism, and sought a mode of governance that kept those moral passions and convictions at a certain distance from the center of political debate and public life. And what filled that space uh, or what the mainstream, uh, what the mainstream parties thought might fill that space was um, a system of globalization that would promote economic growth, the fruits of which could re be redistributed according to something like maybe the difference principle to compensate the losers. And I think it's that picture of politics to call it neoliberal globalization, just to put a, a label on it, has failed. And what we saw in 2016 is the four decades, roughly, where this was the leading public philosophy, going back to uh, 
to, to Bill Clinton and Tony Blair in the U.S. and the U.K. and uh, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany. This orientation to politics, um, which cedes a lot to markets, in part because markets seem to be a value-neutral way of resolving public questions and defining the public good. This has failed. And it's failed in part because it's hollowed out um, the terms of public discourse. It hasn't been able to support or sustain or to generate an ethical life, a Zittlichkeit, <laughs> a sense of shared purposes and ends. And there's now a kind of backlash against it that takes very ugly forms. So it's not a backlash that I welcome, but it's one that's in line with the worry that we were already kind of working out in the 80s and 90s, and that, that I, I tried to develop uh, more fully in uh, this follow-on book you mentioned, Democracy's Discontent, where I tried to show how this version of procedural liberalism or the procedural republic came into American public life in, uh, gradually in the post-war years through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but was flawed. Uh, and that unless we found a way to, uh, to a politics that could uh, aim at a kind of zitlichkeit, a shared ethical life, a stronger sense of community, social cohesion, solidarity than liberalism seemed to be able to provide, we would be in trouble. And we would be in trouble because the vacuum, the moral void, would not be filled with liberal toleration. It would be filled with either fundamentalism, on the one hand, or a kind of uh, xenophobic nationalism. And that, I'm afraid, is what we've got. OK, that's very eloquent and, uh, and, and contains a great deal. It's also something about which I really, really want uh, us to talk in this conversation. Yeah. But forgive me, I won't go away completely from my script, because one of the things that I do want, and I think it, I think it will help us uh, there, I do want to talk to you about your teaching and how that's been such an important part of, uh, of, of being uh, of, of your own uh, philosophical uh, identity. And uh, in part, of course, um, uh, you know, you've prepared the ground yourself in uh, explaining to us uh, how you see uh, political discourse, how you would, would like to engage in a kind of um, extended reflective equilibrium, I won't say with no holds barred, but with no, um, no prior constraint. regulative constraints. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, um, that's obviously something which you've done <laughs> for many generations of Harvard students. Uh, but, and, and, and I assume that a large number of the people who are with us tonight have had the benefit of that. So I won't talk about that so much. Um, but uh, I, I do want to ask um, for your thoughts about extending this, let's call it the Socratic method, out beyond the limit of a university. Um, uh, you, you know, you've done that, you've, you've um, extended uh, uh, philosophy into public spaces, and you've also taken it, uh, and this is something separate that I want to ask you about, uh, across uh, the boundaries of, um, uh, well, of, of particular nations and cultures. But just in general, um, uh, how, you know, Socrates himself was uh, uh, engaged in Socratic dialogue with a slave in the marketplace, uh, 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 the, the, the high point for many of us of the, uh, the, the hopes of what philosophy could, yeah. could, could do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, you've actually tried to do that, not with necessarily with slaves, but with people uh, who are <laughs> don't have any anymore, do we? Uh, but uh, the, the, with people who are outside uh, of an academic context. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about your experience of doing that. Right. Well, partly because we, we put the justice class uh, online and made it freely available, and it was translated in other languages. A lot of people in other parts of the world watched it and found it interesting. And that created the opportunity to travel to a lot of places and uh, 
engage in this kind of discussion with audiences, often student audiences, but not only students, uh, members of the general public who took an interest in various parts of the world, including in places with very different cultural traditions. And I found this fascinating. I found it an education in and of itself to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, it also um, uh, reinforced the experience, reinforced my uh, sense that philosophical argument in a public setting with no prior regulative constraints, as you just put it, Michael, uh, is, uh, it can be energizing and empowering for people regardless of their cultural background or academic preparation. Because the subjects having to do with what's fair, what makes for a just society, what we owe one another as citizens, um, what should be the role of money in markets in a just society, what should we do about rising inequality. These subjects are ones on which everybody has a view, everyone has an opinion, regardless of where they live or how much they've studied the subject. And those opinions, those convictions, are natural starting points for these kinds of discussions. And so uh, I've learned a tremendous amount traveling to various places and having these kinds of discussions. And what draws uh, people most of all is the opportunity to do this in public with one another, where they're arguing not mainly with me, but with one another. And the arguments they find, we find, uh, do proceed on the basis of civility and mutual respect for the most part, <laughs> even without setting out some regulative constraints in advance, which I never do. And you don't really need to because people learn by doing. They pick up the sensibility, the, the ground rules, more or less, in um, pretty much every place I've traveled, with the possible exception of New York. Those are very <laughs> tough. <laughs> but yes. but people, people do this, and, and it does not require the, the ability and in the enthusiasm for these discussions doesn't uh, depend only on having, even, having gone to university. One of the most moving ex such experiences uh, that, that I've had was in um, Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, there are these favelas on the hillside. And they're violent places, and they're places that are often occupied in an almost military occupation by police forces. But I went to one such place and I went to a community center where there was a group of people, mainly but not only young people, and we had, uh, to, to my mind, anyhow, an amazing discussion about uh, violence, justice, citizenship. One of the people I met there was a guy a little bit older than me who um, didn't learn to read until he was 25 years old. He was a, a trash picker. He, picked, he gathered stuff out of other people's trash barrels. That's how he lived. And one day, he was in an upscale neighborhood, and he found in a trash bin or a recycling bin a torn copy of a book. And he took it out, and he started puzzling over it. And the owner of the house came out, asked him what he was doing, and he explained he was trying to make sense of it. And it turns out the owner was, a, I think, a retired uh, philosophy professor. And he taught the guy how to read. And the torn text um, turned out to have been uh, part of the apology, of uh, Plato's apology. 
<laughs> and so this guy at age 25 learned how to read, and then he, he was given an intact uh, text. And he started reading Plato. And then in the favela, he started teaching um, these young activists uh, who are trying to resist this military style occupation and the oppression and the violence. He taught them how to have discussions and that was the group I joined. So seeing, having that experience reminded me of the thrill that Socrates probably had you know, when he wandered down to the port of Piraeus and talked to people. But it's an example of just plunging in without any uh, prior regulatory constraints or constraints of public reason and seeing where it will lead. Well, that's a tremendous story and it's also a great testament to the kind of engagement and optimism that, uh, that, 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 that clearly motivates you in this, 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 this um, global uh, passion that you have. Um, I mean, not having a certain amount of experience talking in different contexts. Um, do you have the experience, I mean, Socrates thought uh, that if you only took long enough, everyone would come to a single view. Right. And uh, <laughs> right. that was... Yeah. Uh, that, I don't that, think that. You don't think that? And does you... But, but does, it, does it then not get frustrating that you just find that people end up saying, well, you know, here I am and that's what my church says or that's what my rabbi says um, or that's what I've always believed and I've always learned and I will just have to disagree. Is that, is that not just where you're going to end up? Well, uh, some people are dogmatic, though I would not say that those whose views are, uh, are informed by religious traditions have a monopoly on dogmatism. Oh, no, I wasn't there, no, by there, no means. No, there are ardent secu that. secularists who are equally dogmatic. So I don't think the dogma aligns itself either with secular or Agreed. religious uh, moral convictions. But um, as for people who say, this is what I learned in my faith tradition, let's say. Uh, for now, they, they can say that in various spirits. They can say that as a way of saying, and I don't want to carry on with you. Or they could say that by way of expressing the views they have on the subject in question, in which case, I see that not as the end of an argument, but as the possible opening of an argument. And I'm, I'm interested in the follow-up questions. Well, some, because sometimes people will say, this is what I learned growing up in this or that faith. And then the follow-up question can be to say, well, tell me more about it, and why do you you know, what drew you to this view? What would you say to this alternative account? And sometimes that can lead someplace interesting. Other times it might just lead to a closing down. But this, I guess, is to reiterate what I was su suggesting earlier, that it's impossible to know until we try. Right, okay. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm interested and would love to go further, but I, I think I'd now might be a good time <coughs> to move back to the thing that you said so eloquently earlier, and I promised to come back to, um, was your diagnosis of liberalism. So let me oh. um, uh, say something. I mean, the way in which you depict liberalism in your earlier writings, yeah. you, both particularly uh, in, uh, uh, as you say, dis democracy's discontent, which I take to be building on and, as, as it were, applying uh, the thoughts of uh, liberalism and the limits of justice. Yeah. It depicts a liberalism that you call a procedural liberalism, yeah. in which the fundamental feature of liberalism is that it um, uh, sets up um, a legalistic framework within which people can basically get on with their lives without uh, too much... Um, fuss, too much public dispute, um, and that that enables them then uh, to have private lives and also private communities, um, which will be um, guaranteed in their peaceable character. Right. And um, 
you know, the first question is, so what's wrong with that? What's, you know, why, <coughs> who, who would need more? Well, who would need more? Uh, do you mean why would we need politics uh, altogether? Yeah, I mean, if, if, we've, if we've got it, I mean, uh, not, I mean, obviously we need politics in some sense, but the, the vision of, 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 of uh, and I think it's not wrong to attribute it to rules, the vision of political science in the United States in the 1950s was that we were past um, the age of contending ideologies, right. and a good thing too, uh, that we could uh, get on and cultivate our gardens, right. Uh, right. And, uh, and more importantly, also associate in ways that, uh, that, that, were, that, 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 that were peaceful, and pursue our interests through politics. It, there wasn't a sense that politics right. would completely wither away and just be right. given up to an administrative state, right. but that politics would remain within um, reasonable bounds. Right, and, and, and that politics would consist in uh, people pursuing their interests, Yes. Uh, consistent presumably with respecting other people's rights to do the same and leaving it at that. Yeah, uh, I I think that the main first of all, that in it didn't work in the world. That proved not to be a satisfy a purely instrumental view of, of political community and a purely interest based conception of of political life. I don't think can sustain itself. Not least, well, one reason it can't sustain itself is that it's not sufficiently meaningful or inspiring. But another way of putting that is that many people include among their interests the desire to um, make the world a better place and to uh, lead a good life. And that leads uh, even the pursuit of one's interests to spill beyond the bounds of private life and to have a public character and ambition. And once that happens, it's not so easy to contain uh, in, in a purely instrumental conception of politics and in a purely interest-based idea uh, uh, of what politics is about. Well, that brings me actually to something that I was already about to say, but it prepares it very well, which is that your conception of liberalism as purely procedural um, is one that I think nowadays um, is somewhere away from what most Americans think of as liberal. Liberalism seems to be um, essentially a progressive uh, doctrine, right. one that's about the extension of rights, the uh, use of the state to enhance the uh, position of minorities and those who may not be minorities but being discriminated against, right. particularly women, right. uh, the removal of barriers to social advancement. Um, isn't uh, liberalism much more of a um, militant uh, conception than this kind of uh, bland uh, withdrawal from, from politics that you are envisaging. So yeah, doesn't, that, yeah. doesn't that, doesn't that uh, 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 well, to, to, to be rude, um, forgive me, uh, aren't you uh, creating something of a straw man? No, I, I agree with, I, I find that morally more robust uh, kind of liberalism uh, preferable to a more purely procedural, morally abstemious liberalism, but the more morally robust liberalism, which is a kind of uh, synonym in the American context for progressive uh, politics, requires resources of solidarity and mutual obligation and commitment to our fellow citizens than a a purely procedural account of politics provides. So uh, if by liberalism you mean a broadly progressive uh, outlook on what a good society looks like, including the public provision of important shared goods, 
uh, whether health care or education of a certain kind, that requires building social solidarities and common identities that depend on moral resources that procedural liberalism can't supply. It takes us back to the need for an ethical life. So if, if the morally more robust liberalism is one that is uh, situated in and nurturing of a Sittlichkeit in order to realize its ambitions, then, well, that's a version of politics with which I have a great deal of sympathy, but it's no longer the version of liberalism that insists on the priority of the right over the good or on constraints on liberal public reason or on a purely interest-based conception of what the political consists in. Well, that's starting to bring us to our present discontents. Yeah. Um, because uh, that, as you say, say, more robust liberalism and more progressive liberalism and more um, socially emancipatory liberalism, yeah. which uh, you know, no one uh, who crosses a Harvard Yard could fail to recognize has a great deal of appeal to, to, to many people. Yeah. Um, is by no means shared um, across societies these days. Right. On the contrary, right. um, it seems to be something towards which um, a large number of um, Americans, and not just Americans, um, react with uh, something like horror and allergy. So isn't it a bit odd to say, well, that kind of liberalism can rebuild a shared sense of social solidarity? When on another point of view, it's maybe that it's that kind of liberalism um, that has, uh, you know, from the from the outside um, has has led to, to to such deep cleavages in the first place. Well, the solidarity, the search for solidarity, has to uh, interpret the anger and resentment of. Um, the people who are drawn to the populist revolt against liberal elites and who voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. The solidarity has to begin with uh, asking why they're so angry and resentful and whether there may not be, as I think there is, some legitimacy to many of the grievances that animate that protest. And uh, among the grievances, is the sense that liberal elites, by insisting on what we've been calling the constraints of liberal public reason, exclude and look down upon um, their concerns and support a version of market-driven globalization that relegates them not only um, to the bottom of the income scale um, with rising inequality, but that also deprives many working people of uh, social recognition and esteem. So I think a, a political program that uh, seeks to build solidarity requires uh, listening to um, those, especially those who've been left behind by market-driven or neoliberal globalization, uh, and ask whether some of their grievances aren't legitimate. OK. So uh, I'm going to come back uh, to, to, to this. But, but, but as we do, and I think you'll understand this, I've just put up a slide which uh, uh, I, I, I hope everyone will find entertaining. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 this comes from your youth, Michael. Uh, in this high is, school. This is your life. Uh, right. uh, the, the, this was uh, in high school. Uh, on the left is, uh, or on the, uh, yeah, my left is, uh, is uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. And on the right, uh, a rather younger, but equally <laughs> <laughs> dapper, uh, <laughs> Michael Sandel. So uh, you were uh, engaged in a debate with him. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, 
I'm glad you didn't ask people to guess who was who in the picture. <laughs> I was... Uh, the long hair is a giveaway. Isn't right. It? <laughs> I was 18 years old. I was uh, in my senior year in high school uh, in uh, Palisades High School in a uh, western suburb of Los Angeles. And um, Ronald Reagan was the governor of California at the time and a leading uh, con conservative figure in American politics. Um, the high school I attended, which was a large public uh, high school in an affluent community, uh, had about 2,400 students, uh, few if any of whom agreed on much of anything with Ronald Reagan. It was a very liberal left-leaning uh, community in high school. So I thought it would be interesting. Uh, I was student body president at the time. I thought it would be interesting to invite Ronald Reagan uh, to come for a, a debate and a discussion uh, about politics. I sent an invitation to his office in Sacramento and got no reply. But my mother read in a magazine that he was fond of jelly beans. So I went out and bought six pounds of jelly beans, put them in a box with a bow and an invitation and took them to his house. He actually lived in the district of the school. And I took them to his house. This is the early 70s, so it was a time of protest. Uh, and he was the target of protest uh, as a conservative Republican against the Vietnam War. And so when I arrived at his house, there were state troopers in a guard, in a bar, in a, at the front of the driveway who were rather skeptical of this box of jelly beans. <laughs> and and they, uh, they also had German shepherd dogs. And being afraid of dogs, this, uh, this almost made me give up the whole project. But they asked what I had and I, in the box. I said, jelly beans. And they kind of felt around to satisfy themselves that that's what it was. They let me deliver it. This is a more innocent age, I suppose, to the house with the invitation. Someone at the door took it. It wasn't Reagan himself. He wasn't home. And a few days later, he called the school and said he'd come, provided we didn't announce in advance publicly that he would be there. So on the day of the event, we invited all 2,400 students into the gymnasium. And I prepared. I was a high school debater. So I figured I could make quick work of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> he, uh, he, t he had an opposite view on just about everything we believed in. He was for the Vietnam War. We were against it. He was a critic of the United Nations. We were for it. He was against the welfare state. We were in favor. And he was against the 18-year-old vote, which, of course, we were all in favor of. And uh, there was a debate whether to have the constitutional amendment for that. So, I prepared a list of devastatingly difficult questions, and um, he parried each one with great respect and sometimes good humor. And uh, I basically uh, didn't lay a glove on him. I wasn't sure quite why not. And then we opened the, the questions to the students. Same thing happened. They asked fierce questions, and one by one, he, in a genial, uh, affable, respectful way, responded. And the hour ended, and uh, I thanked him, and he got into his, his limousine and left. And we weren't really quite sure what had happened. He hadn't, he hadn't persuaded us uh, on any of the views we found objectionable. But he had impressed us in a way mainly because he listened to us respectively, uh, respectfully and engaged with us. And um, it was, I suppose, uh, the talent, the surprising talent, that led him to be elected president of the United States um, nine years later after one, one or two failed attempts. Well, now. Um it's a little later, um, you don't look quite the same, but you still have 
uh, if not the high school debater's talent, perhaps one that's uh, been honed in, 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 in other arenas. If you had the current President of the United States sitting next to you, how would you start a, um, as you say, with no regulatory, uh, regulative holds barred uh, dialogue with him? What would you say to him? What sort of questions would you open with? Maybe I would begin by asking um, a lot of working people who were left behind voted for you um, because, uh, because they were frustrated about how their lives were going and how the mainstream parties Democrats and Republicans weren't really paying attention to them. They elected you. How exactly have you helped them? Now, he, he, would, he would give some answers, but I guess that's how I would start. OK, so you see uh, him as principally appealing to um, people who've been economically left behind in uh, part, in part. There, there are those who voted for him, Republican, standard Republican vote, uh, affluent voters uh, voted for him uh, because they thought he would cut their taxes, just to put it in very simple terms. And another important part of the electorate, including many who had voted previously for Democrats and some for Obama, uh, uh, disaffected working class people also voted for him. So I think and this is pulling back from the question you asked me to imagine that I would put to him. But the way I would run against him, if I were running yes, uh, against that's him, a, that's a, that's going a, back that's to my, a better question. my previous temptation to go into politics, the way I would run against him would, would be to resist the temptation, which is very powerful, to declaim about how he's violated constitutional norms and he's indulged and encouraged and fomented uh, racist attitudes and so on. I would, I would rein that in. Because instead, I would make an argument that would invite back those who took a chance by voting out of anger and resentment and frustration for him. And I would, I would say two things. First. Um, he promised to be a different kind of Republican. Um, but actually, he turned out to be, once he got there, a standard Orthodox Republican uh, cutting taxes, cutting your health care, not really protecting, as he said he would, Social Security and Medicare. He really, he really wants in the second term to do that. He's really, after all, a Mitch McConnell Republican, even though he ran and appealed to working people as more of a renegade. So he's, an, he's a Mitch McConnell Republican after all. Uh, he fooled us, us. He fooled many of you. And it's understandable that he did. But now we see that he tried to basically cut health care and, and cut rich people's taxes. It's the same old thing, number one. And I wouldn't attack him for being a dictator or an autocrat or a king, as some of them were with the impeachment, because that builds him up. I would, I would say, uh, and it's, it's a clownish presidency, really. It's clownish, and it, it, it's, it's a, it's a fake, it turns out to have been a fake populism. And it's clownish besides, and we can do better. OK, but uh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, my job is to say, but uh, you seem then to, uh, to and I, I understand why, uh, to be basing a, an, an, an argument not with Trump, but against Trump, on what looked like very standard politics of interest uh, types of consideration. And uh, that doesn't seem to be the, um, right. as it were, uplifting republicanism that we were hearing about earlier. All right. Well, moreover, I didn't give... Moreover, yeah. uh, if, I, if I could also say, there's a, a view of Trump which says um, it, that it is more sinister. So partly this kind of 
uh, rather <laughs> uh, black joke of envisaging him uh, next to you, um, was meant to illustrate, uh, as it seems, that he really isn't someone you can talk to. You can't argue with. I mean, uh, you know, whatever you think about right. Ronald Reagan, whether he was arguing seriously or just right. engaged in a kind of rhetorical deflection with a genial uh, manner, which he very much has, um, you know, the, that, that was an older style of politics yeah. to, to the one that we see uh, with Trump. He, Reagan wasn't about taunting, um, vindictiveness, right. Right. and uh, the, uh, the, the scary, uh, well, <laughs> there are so many scary parts of uh, what's happening in modern politics, but one of them is that it doesn't seem to be appealing to rational faculties. It doesn't seem to be about, um, you know, here, look, you've been left behind, uh, we'll lift you out of it. It's as much as anything, um, here are these people who are really hateful. I hate them as you do. And we know exactly who they are. They're not just people like us in uh, universities, but they're also the really wretched people, disadvantaged minorities in America. So, you know, once you have that kind of politics, um, the, the, the awful thought is right. there's, there's, there's little left even for the politics of interest. We may be beneath Right. I, yeah, I don't mean to suggest that the politics of interest is what I would run on, imagining myself yes. as the candidate. So let me, let me fill it out. First of all, to, to the last point you made, I think it's important to distinguish between the way one would try to reason with Trump, which I agree would be hopeless, and the way one would try to reason with the people who voted for him last time, but who uh, are some of them persuadable this time. I think it's very important to distinguish those two things. And uh, as for the politics of interest, I don't think that that's any more available or persuasive now than it's been throughout this roughly four decade period. I think that, the Demo that um, Trump won, narrowly, but won, <laughs> in, in large part because the Democratic Party uh, was um, politically and ideologically um, exhausted and even bankrupt and had lost the ability to speak to um, the working class constituency that was going back to the New Deal, its main reason for being. The same can be said, I think, for the social democratic parties of Europe, who also, like the Democratic Party in the United States, have become, just in the last couple of decades, more a party of college educated and professional classes than parties of working people. Uh, this is true of the Democratic Party of the United States, uh, the, uh, the socialists in France, the, uh, the uh, German Social Democrats, the Labor Party in Britain. Uh, they have been parties that have increasingly become parties of the college-educated professional class, not of working people. And that's their own fault, and that's connected to their embrace of this neoliberal version of globalization since the 1980s. And that's what has to change. And the way it has to change goes well beyond any kind of a politics of interest. I would make one central feature of a rejuvenation of, well, social democratic or progressive politics the theme of the dignity of work. What actually is the dignity of work and what does it require in concrete terms? And how can it speak to the legitimate frustrations? Not the ugly expressions that those frustrations take abetted by Trump and uh, xenophobic politicians, demagogues, but the legitimate grievances and frustrations uh, about being left behind, not just economically but culturally. Um, over, the, uh, over the last 30 or 40 years. So that's where I would begin. And that actually involves a, a politics that centers on the dignity of work, trying to articulate what that means, uh, is not a politics of interest only. It has economic components, but it's a politics of recognition of a kind. Uh, because I think at the heart of the populist protest against 
mainstream center left and center right uh, parties uh, is a grievance about uh, social esteem and the lack of recognition. And so I think the, the common distinction between economic arguments on the one hand and cultural arguments on the other is a false distinction. It's too sharply drawn. Uh, the dignity of work recognizes the sense in which economic and cultural dimensions of politics come together in describing the plight and the frustrations of working people, uh, really not just working people, those outside the 10 to 20 percent who have gained, those whose wages have stagnated uh, for 40 or 50 years, uh, the toll it's taken is not only uh, an economic toll, but also a toll on self-esteem and social recognition. So that's what I mean by a, a politics I, I of think dignity. I, I, I know we, I'd like to uh, open the discussion yeah. now, but I don't want to do it before um, I've done something which, you, um, which, which you've started already. Um, I wanted to ask you to say very briefly what the argument is um, about the tyranny of merit. Right. After all, uh, you know, when merit, uh, it's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, Aristotle said, give the yeah. flute to the flute player, and, uh, you know, on a very simple level, that seems like yeah. a pretty good idea. Right. So what's the tyranny of merit, very right. briefly? Well, this, it, it is closely connected to what I've just been describing. Um, the tyranny of merit, which is, is the, the new book I've been working on, is really about this, that hand in hand with the globalization of the economy and basically all the rewards of economic growth going to the top, roughly 10, 10 to 20 percent, everyone else um, stagnant or losing ground. What makes that all the more galling, what adds insult to that economic injury, is elites looking down and people sensing that elites are looking down. And what's going on, I think, the tyranny of merit consists in the tendency of those on top to believe that their success is their own doing, that they made it on their own, that they deserve having worked hard, gone to college, having worked hard, they've earned it. Meritocratic hubris is how I describe it. And I think meritocratic hubris is the um, besetting, debilitating affliction uh, that undermines the dignity of work, respect for working people, and the ability even to listen to and understand why they're so angry. Um, simply to cast them as a basket of deplorables, well, that's an instance of the meritocratic hubris that I'm describing. And because if you believe, this goes back to Michael Young, who coined the term meritocracy in the late 50s. He saw this, that it's a good thing to uh, create a society where people can rise um, based on their own talents and effort. That's a good thing. But it easily leads to a society where those on top believe they've earned it, they therefore deserve the benefits that go with having landed on top. And by implication, those on the bottom must deserve their place as well. And uh, that's, that's the, the meritocratic hubris that creates the impression, not altogether misplaced, that elites look down and believe that those who haven't flourished in this economy uh, have no one to blame but themselves. And so that's why I say the, the that's why I see the a, a politics that begins with the dignity of work would be a kind of antidote to, a corrective to the meritocratic hubris that has left 
um, social democratic parties and the Democratic Party in the US out of touch with the anxieties of the age. Well, thank you. That's a great thing to start to open the conversation, in, among other reasons, because um, although I've done my best to try and uh, push uh, yeah. uh, gently against some of the things yeah. you said, I couldn't think of a single thing to say against that. I couldn't agree with you more. So uh, we're going to invite questions from uh, the floor. And uh, I'm, when I recognize you, I think there are some, uh, we have, yes, yeah, some colleagues with microphones. So perhaps, uh, that, um, could you, Alex, uh, could you? Hello, I wonder how you balance the dignity of work against a sense of humor or other aesthetic considerations. Right. Some people think Trump's hilarious and he could be destroying the world, but we're all gonna die anyway. Right. I think a sense of humor is important in politics because it goes with a kind of um, A, current, a kind of lightness of being that can um, create an openness to uh, listening to those with whom one disagrees. And I think this is one of the weaknesses of an approach to Trump, and we'll see how this plays out in this campaign, that is so heavily invested in the threat to constitutional norms that he represents, which he does represent, but that so uh, emphasizes that, that it builds him up rather than dismisses him as a clownish figure. Um, who has also, uh, in addition to his clowning, clownishness, betrayed the promise he held for a great many working people. Nancy Pelosi had a keen insight when she was hesitant about impeachment, saying he's not worth it. She had a keen political instinct then. She wasn't able to sustain that once the Ukrainian call came out and so on. But that kind of lightness, of attitude, pointing more to his buffoonery than to his quasi-dictatorial um, uh, impulses is a better way of dealing with the threat he represents. Yeah, I have to interject. There's a, for the, the late great uh, comedian Peter Cook uh, founded uh, a, a, sat a satirical club called The Establishment. He said it was based on uh, the cabarets of Berlin in the 1930s uh, that did so much to stop the rise of Nazism. Well, those <laughs> so, were rather heavy places, though. Those, <laughs> yeah, OK, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on your side. So um, yes, uh, please, at the back. Uh, Hi. Um, thank you so much. This was so interesting. Um, my question has to do with um, so I fully agree about the diagnosis you give um, to modern American society, the idea of meritocratic hubris. It seems a theme of the conversation has been kind of to shift back constantly between philosophy and politics. Yeah. And so in that same light, I wanted to sort of connect this to your earlier point and your critique of Kant and Rawls and of the idea of this unencumbered sort of um, floating self with no ties of loyalty or affinity or social solidarity. It seems, if I'm not mistaken, that part of the sort of prescription you give to this diagnosis of division and meritocracy um, is the idea of fostering a sense of social so solidarity, this idea of a shared common life. Um, so this leads me to sort of two distinct but related questions. The first is, how feasible do you think this is in a practical, in a practical way in the United States in terms of fostering this kind of social solidarity? And no. second of all, what do you think of the kind of moral implications of having social solidarity or a shared life as a kind of precondition 
to certain forms of justice as we understand them, especially when we think about this question, not in terms of like within a certain country, between the top and the bottom, but rather in terms of distributional justice among various countries and development gaps, and whether you think that a kind of distributive justice can be achieved in places that don't share a common life, such as developed versus developing countries on a more kind of meta level. Right, so. well, to, thank you, Yumna, and it's a, question about social solidarity in a, uh, that comes from a continental perspective. And to take the first part of the question, the United States has always uh, struggled uh, to create social solidarity and has come by it less readily than France or uh, some other European countries, so much so that the American welfare state was built in large part by relying less on solidarity than on notions of freeing the individual to pursue his or her own ends effectively and creating the social and educational conditions for doing so. For example, when Franklin Roosevelt established Social Security, he didn't really defend it in the name of social solidarity. He brought in a system that, and presented it, a, a, a system of retirement security that has a, a redistributive element but he brought it in under cover of a kind of insurance policy that you might invest in as an individual to save for your own retirement. And he did this most conspicuously by funding it through a payroll tax. Contributions, he called them, that all employees have to pay. It's taken out of your paycheck. And it was pointed out to him at the time that this is a regressive way of funding Social Security. And he said that may be so, but by having this payroll tax contribution, no damn politician will be able to get rid of my Social Security program. So you might say he knew his country well. He didn't defend it. Uh, on solid risk to grounds of a kind that European countries might uh, have done. He gave it a kind of individualist rationale, even though people sort of knew it wasn't a purely voluntarist scheme. It was mandatory, after all. So Americans have always made concessions to the individualist strand of the political tradition. And yet, that strand has always been in a kind of dialectical tension with uh, small r Republican understandings of figuring out what it takes to build a common life sufficient to Republican government. And the early uh, American small r Republicans, going back to Jefferson, did believe that politics uh, had to be able to cultivate civic virtue, did have a formative mission. So this is the Republican strand in the American tradition does depart from a purely individualistic idea. But it's, uh, it's provisional, it's uh, in tension with this more individualistic self-understanding. As for how this plays out in uh, development <laughs> economics globally, that's, that's a larger, it's an important uh, question, a larger question that, uh, that's harder to answer quickly here. But thank you for both parts of the question. Just down the front here, please. Gentlemen here. 
Thank you for your comments. I really enjoyed them. Uh, I'm curious about your uh, view on the dignity of work. So the concept of a universal dignity of work politically and theologically has often been a strong conservative talking point yeah. used to mitigate the necessity of reform for working class positions. They frame labor movements and unions as unnecessary or insulting due to the universal dignity of work. Well, How do you some, some sort do. of... I mean, yeah, yes. Um, how do you reconcile the framing that some do use this ideal as a conservative push in your vision for this tool being used to reach across the aisle? I think the, you're, I, I agree with you that the dignity of work has been invoked by conservatives. And I think that's, um, that's a resource, a starting point for building a broader kind of politics that um, disrupts or confounds existing uh, partisan uh, allegiances. Uh, one person, one political figure who did this quite effectively was Robert F. Kennedy. In 1968, when he was running for president, he articulated a very powerful account of the dignity of work. He was a critic of welfare, so that was the conservative resonant. He thought that, that um, work was necessary to social standing and civic participation. Um, but he wanted, as an alternative to welfare, to provide a more serious, substantial effort to uh, make it possible for everyone to be able to find a well-paying job. So even following that through raises questions about minimum wage, wage subsidy, which recently some conservative uh, thinkers have endorsed, actually, a wage subsidy, which goes well beyond the free market version of conservative politics. Um, from a progressive point of view, the dignity of work um, is threatened or shadowed by the financialization of the economy, which is something that conservatives don't often attend to. Many liberals also don't attend to that. So I think the fact that the dignity of the work has some conservative and some progressive uh, social democratic resonance is a promising feature of it, provided we work creatively to try to kind of work out not a single platform, but maybe competing approaches to the dignity of work that could lead to a, a less hollow political debate than the kind we've become accustomed to. Um, just there, please. Uh, thank you, and thank you both for uh, drawing attention to the at least the two ways we use liberalism as a Brit moving to America is very confusing um, because we mean something different, I think, in your, in your traditional sense. Um, it's very uh, cool these days to hit on the meritocracy. I feel like that's a very consistent message that we're getting from a lot of different people. It's cool. Uh, cool or cruel? Cool. Cool. Like it's the in thing to do to hate on the meritocracy. Um, and... And I, you know, a, a decent uh, helping of humbleness is 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 clearly in order. But I, I was hoping you would say something more about the constructive side around the dignity of work and what that actually uh, looks like. How do you think we get to that? Is it more about focusing on individuals flourishing in their own unique ways? What what does it what does it entail? It would. I would begin uh, by. Uh, challenging the, the picture of political economy that has predominated over the last four decades, roughly speaking, the market-driven or neoliberal version of globalization that basically says we should maximize GDP through free trade agreements um, and through uh, free capital flows and so on. Um, and then, for those who are left behind, uh, redistribute. Um, we have to begin, I think, by challenging that picture 
First, by noticing uh, it hasn't worked out that way. All of the social democratic uh, figures going back to, uh, or, or Democratic Party figures going back to Clinton, Blair, Schroeder, forward, up through, um, up through the present, really, the, the pursuit of economic growth through free trade, free capital flows, and so on, the so-called Washington Consensus, happened. But the compensation to the losers didn't ever come. And that's partly because empowering finance, financial industry, which was one uh, powerful driver of this, created a kind of oligarchic capture of representative institutions that prevented much compensation from taking place. That's part of the problem. Another part of the problem is the winners lived lives that were so far removed from the majority of the, their countries, their fellow citizens, that they lost touch with what was happening. One vivid illustration of this is the central means of helping was thought to be upward mobility through education, increasing access to college. But four decades later, to take the US and the UK, only a third of adults have a college degree. Most people don't. And so to put the emphasis or to see the solution for those left behind as getting more people to go to college um, is, it disparages uh, and in a way gives up on the life experience of the majority of, of um, citizens. And, and so I think part of the, uh, a, an agenda of the dignity of labor uh, puts less emphasis on the promise of rising and mobility as an answer to inequality, and instead uh, takes on inequality directly, not by saying, well, we'll, we'll we, some of you can move out of it if only you, you get good education. And to make life better and more uh, dignified for people who don't go to college but who nonetheless can be equipped and empowered to make valuable contributions in the workplace and to the common good. And then the question is, what kind of educational programs, job training programs, can not only equip those who don't have a four-year college degree to get uh, uh, good jobs that can support families and communities, but also how can we um, reconfigure the economy of, of esteem and of social recognition uh, to reverse the tendency of according prestige only to the professional classes and relatively little to uh, uh, little esteem and recognition the contributions by those made uh, who've, who've not been to college, but on whom all of us depend. Those would be some of the ways. I would also take on finance, the role of finance in the economy, which has been a powerful driver of some of these tendencies. And change the tax code to give less advantage to, um, less advantage to the financial industry and so on. So that's, that, that would be another economic dimension of, of um, a politics of the dignity of work, even though it's not directly about uh, working people uh, themselves. Does, does that address what well, you asked? I think we've got time for one more question, I'm afraid. Um, the gentleman in the, uh, with the pink tie um, has had his hand up for a while, so if we could um, ask. Thank you, Professor Rosen, Professor Sandel. 
Uh, I'd like to go back to um, uh, Yumna's comments and the connection between uh, philosophy and politics. Yeah. How do you see, Professor Sandel, the connection between your book, Now the Tyranny of Marriage, and your previous book, Liberalism and the Limits of Justice? How do you see uh, the uh, liberal neutrality and the ideal of the unencumbered self leading to meritocracy and uh, uh, to the tyranny of marriage, and how exactly does that play out for you? Right. Yeah, it's, thank you for the question, and it's a subtle playing out because uh, Rawls has an argument against meritocracy. He's not for that because uh, he, he thinks that even if there's fair equality of opportunity, um, people have different native talents and gifts, and that's arbitrary from a moral point of view, and so it's a mistake to think they deserve the rewards that flow from the exercise of those talents, even against the background of fair equality of opportunity. So there you have a critique of meritocracy. However, the, the liberalism that flows from that picture lends itself to, is vulnerable to appropriation by a market-driven version of, uh, uh, of mobility and opportunity that begins to generate hubristic attitudes that come pretty close to the ones that a meritocracy would generate. So here's how a response, a critique of meritocracy, would have to go beyond the philosophical conception that Rawlsian liberalism provides. What really fuels meritocratic hubris is the idea that if you have e genuinely equal opportunity, then those who rise to the top have earned their rewards. Let's assume even that the basic framework includes the two principles and the difference principle. What do the people who rise to the top in a just society, as Rawls would conceive it, what pride do they take in the winnings they achieve? Well, the system that allocates those winnings is the market, the market against a background of, of a just basic structure. And the market gives a certain answer to the question, what does it mean to contribute to the common good? Well, what it means is to um, reap the rewards that the market bestows on the exercise of talents, subject to fair quality of opportunity, lifting everyone up to the same starting point, and, it's, uh, and so on. But Market outcomes may reflect bad preferences or ignoble base preferences. And so really to criticize market outcomes, once you've got fair equality of opportunity against a fair basic structure, requires a critique of the preferences that markets um, uh, aggregate and reward. But to evaluate those preferences uh, requires being judgmental about their worth, their value. And to do that uh, runs afoul of the strictures of liberal public reason, that kind of uh, judgment about the moral worth of preferences that markets aggregate and allocate. So, um, that's, that's the philosophical connection to the way um, meritocracy goes wrong. <laughs>
The only way well, out of it, the only way out of the tyranny of merit is to ask what really counts as a contribution to the common good. And that carries us on back to the terrain of the good life. Well, that's a great way to end, of course. Um, and I have only one more thing to do, which is to um, articulate some thanks. And thanks to our sponsors, the Edmund J. Sanford Center for Ethics and the Department of Government. Our thanks to our audience for uh, listening so patiently and engagedly and uh, for asking such helpful and penetrating questions. But above all, of course, on your behalf, to Michael himself. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Great.